Hello, my name is Thomas and welcome to this episode of British Culture, Albion Never Dies. Today's episode is called M is for the National Health Service. This was suggested first by my friend Ian in Shenzhen and was also suggested by Instagram Secret Flower and Izzy Ready. Actually, a few other people as well was commenting, surely N must be for National Health Service. In 1992, Nigel Lawson, Conservative Minister, called the NHS the closest thing the English people have to a religion. And really nothing else could come close. I think this is something that most British people love and absolutely, <laughs> absolutely love. Most people were born in it now. It was established in 1948, or at least the first hospitals opened up in 1948. And so most people today living in Britain were born in a National Health Service hospital. Of course, there are a few others. There's British military hospitals and so on. And there are some private hospitals, but most people were born in them. Um, so most of the NHS staff were born in the NHS. Um, it's a it's an interesting institution. I was looking into the, the origins of it. Nive Bevan in 1948 uh, opening it up in the 1946 National Health Service Act. And really, the 1945 election was partly over this. And of course, there are also origins going back to the interwar years and even yeah, the late Victorian era actually discussing the poor laws. There's been a long origin to it but when I was thinking about this often when I look at something very very British I go back and I look at the the history of something even though I'm not a historian and I do make that comment sometimes but I think for the NHS is something that whilst the history is very interesting it's not its defining feature Really, its, it's living feature today is the most important thing. And it's a topic that I think is interesting, I hope, to most people. Uh, I noticed that for my last few episodes, although people listened in over 25 countries, the majority of people listened either in the United States or in the United Kingdom. The statistics, if you're interested, are about 40% of people in the USA, 32% in the United Kingdom, and everybody else in other countries are just... Germany, Spain, Canada, Australia, Hong Kong, China, Denmark, and so on. So, so this is interesting because British people do look at the American Health Service and American people do look at the British Health Service. I'm not sure if the view we have of each other is entirely accurate, but then again, I'm not a, a total expert on this myself. There are some things that have passed into popular legend in the United Kingdom, or they might not be so well known in the United States. I don't know if Americans realize that in 2009, the American magazine Investors Business Daily had an editorial which said the following, People such as scientist Stephen Hawking wouldn't have a chance in the UK where the National Health Service would say the life of this brilliant man because of his physical handicaps is essentially worthless. This became legendary in the UK and was much quoted because, of course, Stephen Hawking is British and his exact quote on the NHS is, I wouldn't be here today if it was not for the NHS. So why on earth was this American magazine publishing it? Of course, that's because the United States is looking at its own healthcare system and looking at how to improve it. Of course, US conservatives worry about nationalisation and worry about big government, and that's what they perceive as happening in the UK. Whilst, of course, in the UK, people worry about privatisation under especially conservative governments. So it's something that both are talking across, I'd say, at cross-purposes, because, of course... Nobody in the United States is suggesting having a system exactly like the National Health Service, and I, who knows who in the UK really wants to have an American-style health service. Again, I often look at historical things, but this is such a current thing, it would seem silly of me to, to dodge this one. So I was looking through lots and lots and lots of different articles on this, different claims being made. Ultimately, I just went to the academic journals. The British Medical Journal is a natural one for me to go to. And I just found something very, very interesting that resonated with my own experience, but also the experience of people that I've actually met, people I actually know. The title of it is Comparative Twin Study, Access to Healthcare Services in the NHS and the American Private Insurance System. It's a comparative twin study. That's not two separate studies. It is a study of two twins. So there's two twins, both of whom are very well educated. They both have PhDs. Um, they both work in the medical industry. They are what you might define as expert customers. Sadly, they both developed cancer, but happily they were both successfully treated for it. One treated in the USA and one in the UK. I found this really interesting because a lot of studies of the two systems would ask of, you know, 
what if you were poor in the United States? What if you had no medical coverage? They're looking at the worst case scenarios. This was really comparing two people who were actually in very, very good uh, situations. Um, so it's Nora and Nancy, real names. Uh, Nora is in the UK. Nancy is in the USA. And Nancy has very, very good medical coverage living in New York. So this is from the British Medical Journal. There is a kind of easy read version on a blog called The Conversation. And it was written by Nora Gross. Uh, she's the one living in the UK. But they worked on this paper together. It is a very, very interesting one. Um, I can't just read out some of this because I feel they're such experts it would be silly of me to try and rephrase. Uh, so from the article right at the beginning, she says... Obviously, this is an idiosyncratic comparison, but on behalf of both of us, we can say the following. Cancer is always a daunting medical diagnosis. To the list of life and death questions that any cancer patient reflects on, there are other issues, family, work, future, that all who face cancer must consider. Nora was able to confront many of these issues without worrying about a mounting pile of bills and ongoing monetary negotiations with her healthcare providers. Nancy's primary attention was focused on managing the complex financial issues surrounding her illness. While many U.S. insurance companies and politicians loudly proclaim that national insurance systems such as the NHS do not work, in our experience this is far from true. There are undoubtedly many problems with the NHS, and the system itself is currently under severe strain. But in the U.K., access to health care is considered a right, not a privilege, and 64.6 .6 million U.K. residents receive health care free at the point of delivery every year. Nancy incurred an additional set of health expenses following surgery during the months she spent negotiating her health care bills. Her previously unremarkable blood pressure skyrocketed. An additional round of doctor's appointments, medicines and bills with inevitable co-payments were needed to keep her blood pressure in check. Nora had no blood pressure problems, but then she did not face piles of bills and was not involved in dozens of phone calls arguing with insurance companies and hospital billing offices. Her only additional expense was that, because the food in the hospital was adequate but not outstanding, her husband paid £6.95 pence for a ready meal from Marks and Spencers the night before discharge. Her taxi ride home was covered by the NHS. They describe their personal experiences, as I say, in the blog, the conversation, and in the British Medical Journal. And I found this really, really interesting, having talked to, to friends who've worked, for example, in, I'd say, the medical industry, but maybe the medical costing industry, talking about the codes for co-payments and so on. What a complex and arcane <laughs> industry it is. And, of course, I have friends working in the National Health Service who are simply focused on providing the best possible care. In the uh, British Medical Journal, they go into wider concerns, which I did find interesting, and there are some issues I hadn't considered before. Here it is, wider concerns. There are other issues involved in a universal healthcare system that receive less attention. For example, in the UK, people young and old change jobs without fear of losing healthcare for themselves or their families, but millions of Americans, health insurance is provided by their employer. Should they, their partner, or children need care, cancer, diabetes, a diagnosis of autism, the condition may be covered only so long as they stay in their current job. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, such people were often locked in a job for years, even decades, because they could not afford to lose their current insurance, and a new employer's insurance would not cover their pre-existing conditions. In the US, even those with excellent insurance plans like Nancy still struggle under a system that needs serious review, and those who cannot afford health care or enough health insurance go without or delay seeking care, sometimes with life-threatening consequence. Health insurance companies can decide what they choose to cover, and, as in Nancy's case, negotiate with doctors and hospitals to establish what percentage of medical costs they'll cover and what will be covered by patients, even fully insured patients. So, it's an interesting one. This is... This is, I say, a huge concern in the United Kingdom, the, the right governance, the right protection for the National Health Service. It has been fought over and fought over again and again, rarely ever since its creation after the Second World War. And healthcare, again, is something that we're, I guess we're all invested in. Um, but this is something I say, British people do look at the American system, people in America do look at the British system. Again, I think it's important to say most British people feel very, very strongly about the National Health Service. For example, in the London Olympic uh, 2012 opening ceremony, there were some fantastic, fantastic displays put on by Danny Boyle. Of course, we all remember the James Bond and the Queen segment. 
there was a fantastic NHS celebration and somebody somebody on one website I was looking at was saying but was this all just government propaganda were they just trying to push a certain narrative and say it was all problem free in reply somebody put in a link to an article in the independent uh, Sunday the 10th July 2016 which says Danny Boyle claims Tories tried to axe NHS celebration in London 2012 Olympic opening ceremony. In fact, this linked to many, many, many other articles. There's even a BBC documentary on this. Danny Boyle claimed his team came under pressure while planning the opening ceremony of the Olympics to drop that sequence about the NHS. The director's comments were shown in a BBC documentary about the Olympics. I could watch that on YouTube and fuel suspicions that Jeremy Hunt, who was culture secretary at the time and then became health secretary, tried to remove the tribute to the health service. Jeremy Hunt was then having lots and lots of issues negotiating pay and conditions with junior doctors. They didn't ever actually named him. He was heavily implied by quite a few people in the documentary. Um, Danny Boyle said, We did have some standoffs. The forces wanted to cancel one of the sequences, cut the NHS sequences, what they wanted. They wanted us to reduce that or cut it or just make them walk around the stadium. Um, he said, That was very against the nature of what we tried to build right from the beginning. It wasn't even about a particular sequence. It was all about the volunteers. And if you make that kind of statement, if you involve them in the process, you're not going to cut them at the end. You have to put your foot down. Danny Boyle ultimately threatened to resign over this and remove all volunteers from the opening ceremony and again I remember when it went out and everyone was sharing about it, people were sharing about say Mr Bean <laughs> people were sharing about James Bond but the NHS is one that rarely rarely grabbed people at the time uh, by the way I should say that Jeremy Hunt told the Daily Telegraph he fully endorsed Danny Boyle's vision including the se section celebrating the NHS um, his only concern in the planning was the length of the show simply because we needed to make sure everyone would be able to get home safely but again, actually, it's really interesting that between the government and the health service, you have clearly, clearly some kind of tension. Of course, I, I can't talk about this without mentioning COVID. Um, I had my podcast a little while ago. Where I mentioned that I myself uh, tested positive for COVID. And for myself, I was very, very lucky. The symptoms were relatively mild. The, the lethargy, the tiredness, the fatigue, it has dragged terribly. Um, I'm still feeling it. Um, so again, cannot not mention it. But again, what are genuinely people in the streets feelings? Well, People were in the street in 2020 every week, 8 p.m. on Thursdays from the 26th of March until the 28th of May. We had this weekly clap for carers. Um, so in the first campaign, 8 o'clock, 26th of March, people across the UK clapped, cheered, bells rang to thank NHS workers for their role in the pandemic. Princess George and Lewis and Princess Charlotte also supported the, uh, the event. The clap, as I say, was every Thursday, just people going out onto their their front porch, wherever they could go to clap so that the noise could be heard throughout the country, the support, the thank you for, for workers in the NHS. Um, and there was also a special clap on the 5th of July 2020 for the 72nd anniversary of its establishment in '48. So again, what were people's real genuine feelings about the National Health Service you could see it. You could see it in the street, and you could see it on the Olympics, and I think you can also just see it in the general tone of debate. People are very, very concerned that the NHS should be protected, but also, I think, very proud. A lot of people would say that the NHS is actually Britain's greatest achievement in the 20th century, and there is competition for that, <laughs> that title, greatest achievement. Um, but I feel it's very, very widely held. So that was the, the first one. Perhaps a contentious one for some listeners, but one that I, again... A lot of stuff you see online about British culture might be comparing the UK to the US, which is an avenue I don't go down very much because I don't think that Britain primarily defines itself as not the United States and vice versa. It's an interesting one. We share a common language and there are Brits in the USA and there are Americans who visit the UK. So I guess it's a natural conversation. But I don't always feel this actually gets to the heart of what is Britishness, which is the guiding question of this podcast. And to be fair, Brits do move to the United States. I'm a Brit in the United States and I'm having a, having a lovely time. Um, but, but this is not the most popular place for Brits to move to. Actually, Australia is. And I see a lot less on the internet about the cultural differences between Britain and Australia. Although there clearly are some and they're clearly interesting. Um, but as I say, I don't often go down the comparative route. But here, I say Brits do talk about the health service in the United States. And Americans do talk about the health service in the United Kingdom. And so when I found literally two twins 
with the same healthcare issue, one going through very good treatment in the United Kingdom and one going through treatment in the United States. Well, that was impossible to ignore. And I should say that both of them praised the actual medical workers that treated them. They praised the doctors, they praised the nurses. Um, they both had fantastic care. It's really just, just the organisation of it. Um, but as I say, that's perhaps one of the NHS's greatest strengths. I did know an NHS surgeon uh, who was offered... Uh, in fact, I believe between double and triple his salary if he went to work uh, at a private clinic. And I'm afraid I can't repeat his replies. It's too rude for this podcast. Um, because he said, I went into surgery to heal the sick. This is a public service. I don't care whether they're rich or whether I get rich. I've got enough money for a pint at the end of the day or two, or in fact as many as I can drink. Um, he wanted to serve. And I think that's a wonderful thing about the NHS, that many, many people who, who work in it see it as a, a real vocation. It is serving others, uh, which, of course, all doctors around the world have. But I feel at least in the NHS, you're supported by the organisation in that goal. OK, my second topic today is N is for number 10. Put forward by my friend Two Green Thumbs, if you're interested in uh, video games, then have a look at Two Green Thumbs on Instagram. I was looking around at the history of Number 10 Downing Street, the, the office and residence of the Prime Minister. And of course, Number 10 has its own website. They have their own history website. And again, I'm not a historian, but Sir Anthony Selden is. And this is what he wrote. 10 Downing Street, the locale of the British Prime Ministers since 1735, vies with the White House as being the most important political building anywhere in the world in the modern era. Behind its black door have been taken the most important decisions affecting Britain for the last 275 years. In the 20th century alone, the First and Second World Wars were directed from within it, as were key decisions about the end of the empire, the building of the British nuclear bomb, the handling of the economic crises from the Great Depression in 1929 to the Great Recession, and the building up of the welfare state, such as the NHS. Some of the most famous political figures of modern history have lived and worked in Number 10, including Robert Walpole, Pitt the Younger, Benjamin Disraeli, William Gladstone, David Lloyd George, Winston Churchill, and Margaret Thatcher. Number 10 has three overlapping functions. It is the official residence of the British Prime Minister, it is their office, and it is also the place where the Prime Minister entertains guests from Her Majesty the Queen to Presidents of the United States and other world leaders. The Prime Minister hosts countless receptions and events for a whole range of British and overseas guests with charitable receptions high up the list. Well, not my words, but the words of the great historian Sir Anthony Selden. So I scroll through the rest of the uh, the website. I was impressed again at the I don't know, the clarity of it. It's a very accessible article um, as it explains uh, the building is much larger than it appears from the frontage. When you see it on the news, it does look like a very regular terraced house. But of course, immediately as you go in, the door lets onto a warren of rooms and staircases. The house in Downing Street was joined to a spacious, much more spacious and elegant building behind it in the early 19th century. Um, it's also spread itself out on either side, so it's a lot wider and a lot deeper than you might imagine. Cavernous might be the word. Warrenous, I think, is the usual word. Or TARDIS-like. Perhaps it is the inspiration for Doctor Who's TARDIS, which looks like a police telephone box on the outside, and when Doctor Who walks inside, it's suddenly a, a massive, massive room. So, number 10 has spread itself either way and taken over much of 12 uh, and 11, the official residence of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, our Finance Minister. So it's number 10, Downing Street. So then I was looking into who is Downing. Um, I was so impressed at this. Again, the official government website says, George Downing gave his name to the most famous street in the world. It is unfortunate he was such an unpleasant man. Able as a diplomat and as government administrator, he was miserly and at times brutal. I was just so impressed that even a British government website says, yep, this street is named after a thoroughly unpleasant person. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. That's why I find British history so interesting, because it isn't always the history of saints. They're not hagiographies. Whereas interested in the history of Nell Gwen, famous prostitute, and Jack the Ripper, famous murderer, as great kings and queens in Churchill. I think that's something that's really, really interesting. We like, I don't know, the rough with the smooth. 
So who was George Downey, and why did he have this unpleasant reputation? Well, he was Scoutmaster General, which uh, makes him in charge of gathering intelligence and managing a network of spies under Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell, of course, defeated the King in the English Civil War. And so, yeah, so George Downing was a servant of the New Republic, a republic that was so unpopular it cancelled Christmas, as we talked about in my deep dive into Christmas with Cain. Um, and he protected the new anti-monarchal uh, Protestant Republic um, and was, in fact, uh, a diplomat uh, to the Dutch. His miserliness is recorded in detail by Samuel Pepys, who, of course, had a, had a secret diary which has since become, like, gold to history. George Downing also had another side, which is that he rose from poverty to high office at a time when that was not admired, and he also changed allegiance with finesse. So he traded secrets and betrayed his friends to gain a royal pardon in 1660 with the restoration of the monarchy and was rewarded with a knighthood. He survived a very, very turbulent time, selling out his friends, but he must have had some good qualities, yet... Most people who have studied this in detail do describe him as unpleasant, and even Winston Churchill um, wrote that Number 10 Downing Street was, quote, shaky and lightly built after the profiteering contractor whose name they bear. He condemned him too. <laughs> but isn't that wonderful? The British establishment condemning the man whose street was named after him. We don't change the name of the street. We're just honest about our history, I guess. Anyway. It is, uh, yeah, the, the house itself, as I say, it's the, the residence of the Prime Minister, but it is notoriously old and shaky, and it's been renovated and renovated and renovated again and again, and built and rebuilt. So again, the, the facade is not quite what the inside is. Um, and of course, during the Second World War, it came under threat uh, during the Blitz, the bombing of London by the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. So in 1940, um, their intense bombing, which came close and close to Downing Street, and indeed a huge bomb fell on Treasury Green near Downing Street, damaging the number 10 kitchen. Uh, Winston Churchill actually wrote about this in his memoir, Their Finest Hour. And this is the quote from Churchill's 1949 a book, Looking Back. He says, We were dining in the garden room of number 10 when the usual air raid began. The steel shutters had been closed, several loud explosions occurred around us at no great distance, and presently a bomb fell, perhaps a hundred yards away on horse guards parade, making a great deal of noise. Suddenly I had a providential impulse. The kitchen in number 10 Downing Street is lofty and spacious and looks out through a large plate glass window about 25 metres high. The butler and parlour maid continued to serve the dinner with complete detachment, but I came acutely aware of this big window. I got up abruptly, went into the kitchen, told the butler to put the dinner on a hot plate in the dining room and order the cook and the other servants into the shelter, such as it was. I had been seated again at the table only about three minutes when a really loud crash close at hand and a violent shock showed that the house had been struck. My detective came into the room and said much damage had been done. The kitchen, the pantry and the offices on the treasury were shattered. Of course, Downing Street had to be repaired, rebuilt, shored up and all that building work could have been ruined. Uh, in 1991, an IRA mortar bomb was fired from a white transit van in uh, Whitehall and exploded in the garden of Number 10, a few metres away from there. The Prime Minister, John Major, was chairing a cabinet meeting to discuss the Gulf War. Nobody was killed, but left a crater in Number 10 gardens and blew in the windows of some neighbouring houses. So again, had to be rebuilt. Again, there's been quite a lot of shoring up. I mean, you know, back when it was first built... Hot running water was not very common, and it certainly didn't happen in Number 10 Downing Street, so uh, hot and cold running water was installed in 1877 at the behest of Benjamin Disraeli, famously fashionable and stylish, and I guess he was kind of so fashionable he, he wanted to have hot baths, fancy. Central heating was only installed in uh, 1937, and of course there's been other things like installing telephone lines and computers and fabulous Wi-Fi. Um, it has had additional stresses on it. Of course, the staff, which had been around 50 for much of its history, were increased to 170. Um, so more recently, Tony Blair ordered lots and lots of renovations and so on. I think the most interesting thing is that the, the facing... Well, number 10 Downing Street is, is quite distinctive. It's black. It's black bricks. Um, but when they were pinning, pinning the front um, using 225 stainless steel pins to, to shore it up, they realised that it's not actually 
black. These bricks themselves are not black. It's a colour wash, effectively, uh, created, well, by the smog of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so the bricks underneath are actually yellow. So when they've done this huge renovations, they've actually had to paint it black uh, to make it look well, just how it should look. Um, it's all been carried out in consultation with English Heritage, a special organisation to make sure things look how they should. So fascinating. It, it is an interesting history, so thank you very much to uh, Two Green Thumbs for suggesting it. I might just include on the way Larry. <laughs> Larry the cat, chief mouser to the cabinet office. So he's been in residence since 2011. He's the first cat at number 10 to be bestowed with the official title chief Mouser. Uh, so he was recruited from Battersea Dog and Cat Home on the recommendation for his mousing skills. He's joined the number 10 household and has made a significant impact, um, especially on the hearts of the great British public and press teams who are camped daily outside the front door and in the nation sent him gifts and treats and so on. So uh, he spends his day greeting guests, <laughs> inspecting security defences and uh, testing antique furniture for napping quality according to number 10 and apparently as for getting rid of any mice, it's all still in the tactical planning stage. <laughs> wow. Okay, our next topic is one that combines a great deal of history but is of great interest today as well, which is N is for Navy. Again, it was suggested by Ian and Jen Jen on Facebook by a lady named Jan, and on Instagram, Sifu Lama, and Two Green Thumbs. Again, for the history, it goes back a long way. The Royal Navy is sometimes known as the Senior Service, as it is the oldest branch of the British Armed Services, and its history really goes back to Alfred the Great fighting the Danes back in 897 AD. It's over a thousand years old. Of course, if we skip through the centuries, we've got great events such as the Mary Rose being launched by Henry VIII and sinking here in 1545, fighting the French, but being raised in 1982, so you can see this complete ship uh, from 500 years ago. Of course, in 1588, we have the Spanish Armada, as the Spanish tried to invade England, and the fight against them was seen from the south coast, and people could see the country being defended by the Royal Navy. We have Samuel Pepys, who I mentioned earlier, he was clerk of acts to the Navy Board in 1660, became secretary to the Admiralty in 1673, and in the same year, Member of Parliament. His great act was to professionalise the Royal Navy, and anyone alive at the time would have, if they knew him, they would know him for this. But these days, he's much better known for his private diary, in which he recorded all his candid, very candid observations about the great and the good around him, and recorded, very honestly, his marriage and his wife farting. So he wrote it in code, in case you were wondering, breaking of that code was a wonderful thing, as we've got such a, a unique insight into a time of change, and of course the Great Fire of London in 1666. Sticking with the Royal Navy though, you can look at Captain James Cook, a British explorer, navigator, cartographer, and captain of the Royal Navy, who of course explored much of the, uh, well... Australia. <laughs> and then Matthew Flinders, the first to use the name Australia in a chart he made in 1804. Again, still the number one place for Brits to emigrate to, so hello Australian listeners, or any British listeners in Australia. In 1807, the UK became one of the first nations to end its own participation in the slave trade, and the Royal Navy went on to lead an international campaign to put down a final end to the transatlantic slave trade, and ultimately end slavery itself. So... If you've been waiting for it, here it is. My recommended rabbit hole is the West Africa Squadron, a Royal Navy unit dedicated to ending slavery, and they rescued hundreds of thousands of slaves and gave them freedom. I could have as maybe a secondary, uh, secondary rabbit hole a very interesting uh, Royal Navy commander named Cochrane. Admiral Cochrane is really, really interesting because whilst there's plenty of fictitious characters based on multiple, multiple real people, so for example, Ian Fleming's James Bond is thought to be a synthesis of many real heroic people, Admiral Cochrane is one person on whom many, many fictitious people are based. So for example, if you read Patrick O'Brien, C.S. Forrester, Captain Myatt, if you enjoy Master and Commander, or if you enjoy Horatio Hornblower, they're all heavily, heavily influenced by Admiral Cochrane. He had a truly remarkable career as a naval officer and as a politician. He served with distinction in the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars, 
He was wrongly jailed for fraud, stripped of his naval rank and parliamentary seat, but then went on to command the Chilean, Brazilian and Greek navies, helping these countries in their fight for independence, and later received a royal pardon and the restoration of his naval rank. Thomas Cochrane is a very, very interesting man. There's a great book called Cochrane the Dauntless, The Life and Adventures of Admiral Thomas Cochrane. It was by a man called David Cordingley. I read this years ago. This is a naval commander who was criticised by the War Office for using too much ammunition. He used it by firing it at the enemy. So he is a fascinating character, brought, brought very, very high by his unique blend of personal qualities and also brought low by those very same unique personal qualities. When you read these fictitious heroes, uh, as say Master and Commander or whatever, you, know, you often have a sense of where it's going. It's you know, it has to follow a certain character arc. When you read the real history, you've no idea where it's going. It doesn't have to make sense. Crazy things can just happen in real life, and they certainly did happen to Thomas Cochrane. So, uh, although the West African Squadron is my primary recommended rabbit hole, I don't know. Just uh, I don't know anything you read about Thomas Cochrane it can just be really fun. <laughs> Just sticking with naval history again, 1900, the relief of Ladysmith during the Second Boer War. Naval guns were landed from the HMS Terrible and the HMS Powerful, and along with the Naval Brigade, uh, they took part in the relief of Ladysmith. Now, the manhandling of these heavy guns over difficult terrain later led to the field gun competition. It's a race of a very heavy gun, which has to be dismantled and taken in parts over a very, very tough obstacle course. It used to be a staple of the now discontinued Royal Tournament. And if you check out, especially the clips from the 1980s, you get some really good, really good footage of it. And it's still, it got later on, it got watered down at the original, um, the original field gun competition is a phenomenal thing to watch and I was very lucky I got to see it in real life and it was as amazing as it looks. Of course, the Royal Navy's history in the First World War, Second World War, Korean and Falklands in 1982 is pretty well known. Um, perhaps less well known when I was starting to look into hang on what bit of history do I want to look into was Bertram Ramsey um, he was on the retired list in 1939 but rose to prominence as the Royal Navy's foremost expert in amphibious warfare during the Second World War he was a master of the complex staff work required for such undertakings and are probably best remembered as being responsible for Operation Neptune, the naval contributions to the invasion of Normandy, the greatest amphibious operation in history in 1944. Sadly, he did die while travelling to see General Montgomery as his aircraft crashed, uh, taking off from an airfield in France in 1945. Interesting man. Then there's, of course... Interesting things, for example, in the Korean War, uh, a pilot from the fleet air arm shot down a MiG-15 jet fighter in a, a propeller plane. <laughs> so the fleet air arm man was in a propeller plane and shot down a jet. So, the Royal Navy has a rich, interesting, complex history. But again, like the NHS, it's not a, it's not a museum piece. It is a very active very engaged organization and in the case of the Royal Navy it is fully engaged in operations all around the globe. You might not be aware of them so I just thought I'd run through a quick list of what they're actually doing. So in the UK of course they're doing patrols, trainings, testing and so on. I was in a university Royal Naval unit and so I was doing patrols and training, coastal navigation and of course going to visit our NATO partners close by. In the Red Sea and in the Gulf, we have Operation Kipion, uh, securing oil routes and anti-mine, uh, especially, for example, after the Iran-Iraq war. There's a huge number of naval mines floating where oil tankers go. Um, so, of course, there is ongoing anti-mines. You put them on those mines and they stay around for a very long time. In the North Atlantic, they're doing counter-narcotics. They have some phenomenal drug busts. Many, many years ago, uh, they busted a ship which had no drugs stenciled on the side. Uh, that's, just, that's just asking for it. Um, in the South Atlantic, of course, there's Arctic surveying and protecting UK interests. 
Uh, in Northern Europe, you've got standing NATO Maritime Group 1, anti-mine again. In the Mediterranean Black Sea, Operation Sophia, anti-arms smuggling. Of course, we have a very uh, tumultuous situation in North Africa, especially Libya. So anti-arms smuggling is of enormous importance in the Indian Ocean, combined Task Force 150, anti-drugs, anti-terrorism, and in the Pacific, aid to the Philippines, both the Royal Navy and Royal Fleet Auxiliary. And of course, in the Caribbean, the Royal Navy provides aid regularly. And of course, global, with our 24-hour, <laughs> seven-day-a-week, 365 or 366-day-a-week uh, a uh, nuclear deterrent, which has global reach. Again, going very, very current, this year's New Year's Honours, 22 personnel were singled out for decorations, 10 honoured for the way they dealt with the coronavirus and its impact on everyday life inside and outside the service. So again, whatever's going on, you can guarantee the Royal Navy will be at the heart of it. I'm going to stick slightly with Lord Nelson, Ian and Shenzhen again. Um, just sent me a cracking list of suggestions and on Facebook Jan uh, and moderator Yvonne suggested Lord Nelson. I spent a lot of time on the Royal Navy but that's a lot of very happily, happy time well spent, you know. Um, so he's a British hero, of course, we've got Nelson's column. Um, like many British heroes, he is not the perfect man. We don't try and remember him as a perfect man. And to be honest, Lord Nelson's story is not the, the happiest story. He was from a very poor but, but educated family in Norfolk. A family member happened to be in the Navy, got him to join as a very, very young boy. And he just worked and worked and worked his way up. His first command was very, very successful unfortunately enforcing some very unpopular trade laws and it's called the Navigation Act and led to him being unemployed for the next five years but as soon as the wars kicked off in Europe the Napoleonic War he was suddenly in his element again his naval success is phenomenal defeating Napoleon at the Battle of the Nile defeating Napoleon at the Battle of Trafalgar ensuring that Britain would be safe from invasion Again, his, his military career is phenomenal. He paid a personal price, of course, losing an arm, losing his eye, and he pushed on uh, with phenomenal success. And yet, that's just one of the three things he's known for. He's also known for his private life, his, his affair, his love child, but keeping friends with his mistress's husband, and the three of them travelling around as a, as a very interesting and very curious group of three. It's one of the second things he's known for, and... He is, of course, known for his death um, at his greatest victory at the Battle of Trafalgar, at the time seen as a greater tragedy than the victory at sea. The significance of the victory took time to be established, so at the time, the Battle of Trafalgar was actually a time of national mourning. He was shot, of course, by a French sharpshooter and taken down below, and, and as he lay dying, it's become legendary that maybe he said to his closest friend, Hardy, kiss me. Which is interesting, he spent a lot of his time, of course, in the, in the Mediterranean, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Surely he would have known the Arabic word for fate, which is kismet. He probably said kismet, Hardy. But nonetheless, it's gone down in history as kiss me, Hardy. Um, and as I say, it's, it's interesting, it's seen as a greater tragedy than the victory at sea. It was just that subsequent reassessment that sees it as the, as the, the tragedy in victory. So Lord Nelson, one of our, one of our greatest heroes, but I feel very well known and there are some fabulous fabulous uh, documentaries on him I suggest the people's profile but one of the best ways to learn about uh, Lord Nelson is actually by visiting the HMS Victory in Portsmouth if you ever have the chance uh, I visited as a small boy and was I don't know gripped by just walking where he walked standing where he stood in fact there's a little plaque uh, showing you where he was standing when he was shot, um, but seeing his war room, seeing his, I don't know, the conditions that the, that the men lived in um, is, is fascinating, it's affecting, obviously it stays with me, um, though I saw it as a very small boy. Um, it's recently come up, the HMS Victory, in Navy News. Uh, the HMS Victory marks 100-year milestone by preparing for a next half century. That's 100 years on from the day the world's most famous warship entered her current home. So exactly a century after Nelson's flagship was moved from the harbour into dry dock number two in Portsmouth Naval Base to protect her for future generations, today's conservationists start work on the next step in looking after the veteran of Trafalgar. There'll be a 15-year programme of work planned for the legendary man of war 
to complete her transformation both as a visitor experience and to display how the great ship looked in her heyday more than 200 years ago. It is indeed, as Bond fans would know, a bloody big ship. It's not the one we see in the painting in uh, Skyfall, but it's, uh, I don't know, it is a great and impressive thing to see in real life. If we're sticking with British heroes, uh, Mary on Facebook suggested N is for Newton, born on Christmas Day, 1643, and of course was the a famous mathematician set out laws that are, we still talk about Newtonian physics, um, at the time, most universities were teaching uh, Plato and Aristotle, but this is the beginning of a scientific revolution, uh, the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment. And he was a key figure. As a, as a student in Cambridge studying Plato and Aristotle, he uh, apparently wrote in the margins of his notebook, Amicus Plato, Amicus Aristoteles, Magius Amica Veritas, which of course means Plato is my friend, Aristotle is my friend, but my best friend is truth. For Newton, I rarely just looked at Encyclopedia Britannica. It's a very, very good article, very well written, and I was astonished at what a tumultuous and troubled life this brilliant mathematician had. He, I remember him for being generous and saying, you know, I only stand so great because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, but my goodness, he had a, had a very, very troubled life. Brilliant, brilliant, but troubled man. I feel if it was any other episode, I'd talk about him even more, but... The strength of the ends, not so many topics this time, but very, very strong, because what? how could it be much stronger than the Norman Conquest? Again, Ian and Chen was on fire with his suggestions. The Norman Conquest was one of his suggestions. What is it? And what are Normans? Who is Norman? <laughs> it's an interesting one. It sometimes gets lost that the Normans are actually Vikings. They're, they're Norsemen, or northern men, who settled in northern France, or the Frankish kingdom, together with their descendants. The Normans founded the Duchy of Normandy and sent out expeditions to, to conquer Italy, Sicily, England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. And originally they were just barbarian pagan pirates from Denmark, Norway, and Iceland. But they, uh, their destructive plundering raids on Europe led to them settling down, and William the Conqueror, his early conquests were, well, was not England, his early conquests were the north of France, and battling against all the local barons and so on. Now, of course, in 1066, he did come over, he did kill the last English king, personally, I think it was an archer who did that, um, but he did take over England, and swept away the Anglo-Saxon aristocracy, for want of a better word, and changed the English language forever. If ever you're wondering, if you're, if you're asked by, by a friend learning English, why does English work this way? Why is there always an exception to a grammar rule? It is, of course, because Anglo-Saxon was a Germanic language. The Normans spoke French by this point, which is a Romantic language. And with the Norman conquest, the two come together. The, the Romantic language being in power, the Anglo-Saxons, of course, having their peasants' language as it became. It wasn't that before. And we have a very, very strange blend. One of the most interesting things about that is that, of course, in English, there's different words for the meat and for the animal it comes from. In many languages, that's not true. In Chinese, a uh, sheep is your yang, and sheep meat is yang ro. But we don't do that. They don't sound similar in English. The reason is that normally the word for an animal, especially one looked after by a farmer, comes from a Germanic root. Like cow in English is coo in German. Whereas, of course, beef... It comes from French, and it's the same for most meats. So basically, the people looking after the animals name the animals, and the people who are eating the meat named the meat. And you can even look at that at government. You know, lots of our political terms come from French. And our art, our literature, our architecture changed. J.R. Tolkien was fascinated by this idea of what if the Norman Conquest had never happened? Um, because, of course, the Anglo-Saxon literature was around, well... It was around heroic sacrifice, really, uh, about men putting themselves out there. It was quite brutal, some of their literature. Beowulf, uh, I think, lays that bare. Whereas the French had romances. You know, we think of the Arthurian legends as, as very, very romantic. Some of that is high French literature. I feel what we have today in English literature, again, is that strange and interesting combination of the two. It's why it's so interesting, why it's so lively. It's two different traditions blended together. The Lord of the Rings was intended as a study of what would happen if you kind of carried on with Anglo-Saxon literature. Part of its inspiration and architecture changed wholly. Really so much of our history changed with the Norman Conquest that I think it earns its rightful place as 
N is for Norman Conquest. Incidentally, the great battle of the day was the Battle of Hastings, um, and there's no eyewitness account of it. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. English Heritage commissioned a battlefield report in 1995, and it, it still stands as, uh, as the authoritative one. There are there are pieces by William of Poitiers, and there's two poems that are sources. There's the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is, I've read that, it's very, very interesting, especially by the fact that it's the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is the, effectively the, the diary, the calendar, for want of a better term, of different monasteries. And all the different monasteries, they share together ideas, and they try to create kind of one kind of document. But actually, there are significant differences between them, not so much for the Norman Conquest itself, but it can be interesting. Some have zero mention of it, and some uh, have have great mention of it. Um, and of course, the bio tapestry, which is of course very interesting because it's not a tapestry and it's not from bio. Um, it is a piece of embroidery. That's a unique pictorial record of a battle and the events that led up to it. But like many, many, many of the the different versions of history of this, it's really just from the Norman point of view. So uh, its work of its value as a work of art is actually outweighed by its importance as a primary source of the Battle of Hastings and the history of England. And, again, I got a, a book of this when I was very young as a reprinting of, uh, of the tapestry, and it's fascinating to go through and try and read into these images what really is the story being told. Anyway... I'm going to, I'm going to rush through, uh, just, just because of time... Again, Ian and Shenzhen, on fire with his suggestions, suggested M is for the North-South Divide. This is a fantastic topic, whether you're on Quora, whether you're on Reddit, whether you're on Instagram, whether you're, I don't know, whether you look at Lad Bible on, on whatever social media you use, people will ask, what's the difference between the North and South of England? And it just carries on and carries on and carries on. There's an article in The Economist arguing the gap between the North and South is life expectancy, political inclinations, economic trends. Um, the North-South divide even has its own Wikipedia page that says that these trends are growing so much they're almost separate countries. My own thoughts are that you do get a significant separation because of Dane law when the Vikings came and settled and we had a kind of a, a truce, a kind of agreement between the Anglo-Saxons and the Danes. Um, then, of course, after the Norman Conquest, you have the harrying of the north in the winter of 1069 to 70 as as the northern barons rebelled, um, supporting Edgar Aethling, who was kind of the elected king, as that was the Anglo-Saxon method, not so much the hereditary method. But the, the Normans were brutal. Uh, the harrying of the north uh, describes a process where about 75% of the population were killed, died of starvation, or simply left and never, ever returned. It depopulated the north in the most brutal and horrific way. It took centuries to recover. Then in the Reformation, the North again kind of resisted a lot of the changes as the South really became more Protestant and the North kind of held on more to being Catholic. But then in the Industrial Revolution, which really started the North of England as the North got incredible wealth and power, the North became more non-conformist. And then of course in the modern day we have industrial decline. So sometimes the North-South divide is really about the power, say based in London, kind of trying to stretch out its influence, not just politically, but also kind of culturally as well, and being, being resisted in different ways. So North-South Divide, what is it? And perhaps, and I'm not sure whether to get into this, the, where is it? Where is the dividing line? What is the North of England? I know one lady um, who's from South Yorkshire, and she didn't really travel much outside of South Yorkshire as a child, but she always thought of herself as being from South Yorkshire, and when she was a, a teen, she went on a, a party holiday to Spain, and it's, you know, loads and loads of Brits in the nightclub, and somebody gets up to the top and grabs a microphone and says, OK, everybody from the north of England, go to this side of the room, and everyone from the south of England, go to that side of the room. And she went to the south of England section saying, Hey, up, lads! And <laughs> was kind of shooed away very, very quickly. <laughs> what is the north? What is the south? Definitely the, the north of some great cities like Newcastle and Nottingham. Nottingham, of course, famously is where Robin Hood comes from. And Newcastle is a great, great northern city that also produces Newcastle brown ale. Now, two great stories about Newcastle. One, I'm going to go to my own first. I was navigating a ship 
up the coast of the United Kingdom to go into Newcastle, and we had one member of the ship who was from Newcastle, and we were joking with him, ah, Newcastle is such a rough town, there are going to be fights everywhere, and he was a perfectly nice, respectable middle-class man who'd been brought up in the nice suburbs of Newcastle. He was like, I've never seen a fight in the street, I've never ever you know, seen this kind of, this supposedly rough town, it's all just southerners are soft, there's nothing going on there. We navigate the ship, of course, to the dock. Docks are never in the nicest part of town, to be honest. But we navigate it there, and almost as soon as we tied up the ship, a minivan screeches to a halt. Two shirtless men fall out the back. They're fighting. There's women in the back screaming at them. <laughs> Perfect. The jokes stopped. That was it. We'd... The experience had peaked. There's another story I've got to tell about Newcastle, which is that, of course, Stella Artois had an advertising campaign years ago, which is, that, you know, if you drink Stella Artois, it's not a glass, it's a chalice. And they had this big billboard in Newcastle that said that, and underneath, uh, Newcastle Brown Ale had a second advert that said, it's not a chalice, this is Newcastle, it's a glass. <laughs> ah. Keep it classy, Newcastle. A few more suggestions. N could be for not the nine o'clock news, which is, uh, of course, Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean. Um, I guess rarely rose to prominence for the first time. It's always funny because Mr. Bean, of course, is a silent character, and Rowan Atkinson became famous for his stand up, for his talking, for his. Yeah, he was, he was not silent. He's a very, very intelligent man. Anyway, it's not the nine o'clock news. Look at the gorilla sketch. It's great. Um, as a man. Just give you a slight trailer. I hope I don't ruin it in the telling. As a man who tells an interview, I've been teaching this gorilla to speak since, oh, I don't know, it must be since 19, 1972, and the gorilla leans forward and says, no, no, it was 1973, I distinctly remember. <laughs> anyway, not the nine o'clock news, fantastic. Noel Edmonds, who hosts his, I guess now he hosts loads of um, game shows, that's what he's famous for, but he used to be a, a great uh, prime time time host in the 90s, Noel Edmonds House Party, and as I know many, many people listen because you follow my, my uh, Instagram account, Fleming Never Dies, I'm going to say, and this is just my own contribution, N is for The Now Show with Hugh Dennis. Hugh Dennis appeared in the opening of No Time to Die as one of the scientists in the lab, um, I'm joking with somebody else, but uh, I mean, I wonder if it was his life's ambition to be in a Bond film. If he happened to know the right people, it was. I was watching. I was like, "It's Hugh Dennis." Um, he, he often plays doctors, and uh, somebody asked, "Do you have medical training?" And I believe it's just the face. He just happens to look like a doctor. I was, I was amazed to see him, and I listen to the Now Show regularly. It's a, it's a current affairs show. I, I don't know if it's that well designed. If you're not from the UK, if if, if you'd learn UK politics, maybe you would. Maybe you would. But if you listen and you have loads of questions, or if you don't enjoy it, just message me. <laughs> Tell me, was it good if you don't know much about British politics? Right, that is all my suggestions for this week. Again, I, the biggest thank you is to Ian and Chen Jen for suggesting all of these. I have to get you on the podcast someday. N must be for National Health Service. The strength of feeling on this was just so strong I couldn't ignore it. And I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed all the suggestions. Of course, N is also for navy love that suggestion and there's so so many interesting stories that you can dive into there i hope you enjoy the rabbit holes which are the west africa squadron and you know if you just want a really interesting story then uh thomas cochran he has a really good first name i'll say that um and he is just a i say he's a very unique individual his manner is inspired in venture stories there's something to live up to Stay safe. See you next time. Thank you for listening.